But again, feel free to ask questions throughout um, if anything I say doesn't make sense. So in my, um, my background is in occupational therapy, and I practiced for about eight years before I went back um, to get a PhD in movement science. So the, the issue of neuro rehab is very dear to my heart, and I really believe in it. Um, I was thinking when I was making this talk, how do you really describe disability? And it seems to me there are kind of three main components, and you can break these down into many, many subcomponents. Um, but when we think about disability, all of these should be addressed. When we think about rehabilitation, it should be a structured, problem-focused, and interdisciplinary. And by that, I mean structured. It shouldn't be just a general thing that everybody gets. It should be something specific to you. It should be interdisciplinary, meaning you need medical help as well as therapies from physical, occupational therapists, speech therapists, um, social workers that can help walk you through the system. Um, psychologists, that kind of thing, too. When we think of rehab, many people want this. So really, you just want to push the restart button on your computer, right, and say, let's just start over. <laughs> and I, I imagine all of us have felt this way. And, and it sounds like rehab should work that way, but in reality, it doesn't. So really, there are many pieces to it, but it's not going to make you back to the person you were 10 years ago, but it's going to try to maximize your capabilities now. So I'm going to talk with you about some rehab um, options that are available now, and then at the end of my talk, I'm going to talk about some future um, studies that are going on that can help advance the field as well. So I start with this quote, the single thing that comes close to a magic bullet in terms of strong, its strong and universal benefits is exercise. And I go back to this because I think this is, everybody knows this, right? This is all over the press. It's all in the magazines. But really living this is different. And, and I, I really, there's a lot of evidence to support this, that we all need to be exercising, whether we have TM or we're a caretaker for someone who has TM, or we have MS or we're a caretaker, or we have someone in our family with MS. We all should be doing this. And let me show you why. Let me first describe weakness, and my, and my interpretation is there's a primary kind of weakness and a secondary weakness. The primary weakness is due to an MS, which is more my specialty, it's the plaques that are in the brain or spinal cord. And it can result in fatigue, paresis is weakness, or um, sensory changes. And it's most common in anti-gravity muscles. And by that, I mean those muscles that allow you to bring, that go against gravity. So your biceps, anti-gravity. Secondary. Secondary weakness is different than the primary. So the primary is really due to the disease process itself. The secondary is usually more avoidable, but we don't avoid it in general. Um, it's due to disuse. So, you know, you find out you have MS and it's hard to move, so you move a little less. You have more fatigue, so you move a little bit less. And it's sort of a spiraling process down. And it, if, if you don't have this disuse, you can do more. But it's a fight. You have to really fight against this incentive to really rest a little bit more and maybe you'll feel better. It's deconditioning. It's those compensatory movements that now you're sort of stooped over a little bit more when you walk. Um, it's that you don't, you don't really walk to get somewhere. You, um, you ask someone to go get something for you instead of getting up and going to do something. Um, pain um, also often is a reason why you don't exercise. Other contributing factors are spasticity, so that tightness that you feel in your muscles sometimes, often in the morning, um, sometimes at the end of the day, and this ataxia, which I'd mentioned before, this inability to coordinate your arms and legs. So this is what we call MS weakness. The primary portion of this is very difficult to treat because it's the disease itself that's causing it. The secondary portion is very treatable and very avoidable if we're aware of it. So why exercise, right? This is, this is an age-old issue. Cardiovascular benefits, strength benefits, cardiorespiratory benefits. It actually helps you breathe better. But also there's emotional benefits and now neuroprotective benefits. And really for, for people with MS and TM, this is huge, right? You want to you have the best, you want to you maintain your body at its best capabilities so that when they do find the cure, you're the person they want to try that medication on, right? You're the person that's ready for that. So I'm going to, 
I'm going to focus on these last two because I think both of them have new evidence out that actually Dr. Kaplan um, brought to my attention that I think is really exciting. So there are several studies out that show that aerobic exercise, so that kind of a exercise that raises your heart rate, makes you sweat, um, is an effective treatment for individuals with depression. So they found literally that exercise was equally as effective as medication after 16 weeks of treatment. Equally as effective. So that means just as diligent as you are about taking your medication, if you're that diligent about your exercise program and that smart about it, then you might be able to change your medication. And that was for 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise. So that's not just moseying around. That's really working and raising your heart rate. And you need to do it several times a week. Now, I say 30 minutes of exercise, and in some people, that's too much. So it's, a, it's again, it needs to be individualized for each person. But I, I bring this up because I think it's, it's very interesting that, that we can actually avoid some medications if you can stick to the exercise program. And that's a big if, because it's much easier to take a medication than it is to get out of bed and, and do something that's going to be difficult. And it is difficult. I, I, I'm with you on that. <laughs> Can exercise influence neuroprotection and neuroregeneration? Again, there are, there are studies that show that exercise has an important influence in people who have neurodegeneration from MS and from other diseases, too. Regular exercise training, that means consistent, promotes protein synthesis in the muscles, myelin protein synthesis, and myelin regeneration. So not, it's not just talk. It's really there's evidence for this. And that's for if you exercise three times a week for 30 minutes, and this 60% of your VO2 peak is a moderate intensity. So, and if you're really interested in doing this, you need to learn more about what do you think moderate is for you, because it's different for each of us. And there's a real easy way to do that, and that is take your pulse and count how many times your heart beats within a minute. So how do you manage MS weakness? You want to strengthen muscles? For the primary weakness part, you want to compensate. So you want to use bracing and mobility aids, canes, walkers, things that you have available. They were designed to help, not to be used as a crutch, which is what many people think that they're for. They actually increase your independence. So if you can use a cane, then you're more likely to walk out the door and go do something because you're not as afraid of falling. If you can use your walker, then you might actually want to walk to get the mail because you know you can sit and rest if you need to. Secondary weakness often overlooked, and it can be minimized with appropriate intervention, meaning exercising the right muscles. And so getting that feedback that you need for what kind of exercise is, again, really important. Excuse me. Okay, there are another, other neuro rehab options, and I'll go through each of these. Um, I thought these five might not be as well known to everyone, so I apologize if it's, if it's a rehashing of all the things for you. So neuromuscular electrical stim. The next few slides are set up just like this. I'll show sort of a general picture. In the green box, I wanted to tell you kind of where you'd find it. So it's in most inpatient and outpatient settings. The potential risks, as I see it, so this is my viewpoint here, initial cost is high for the equipment. Insurance sometimes pays for it. It depends. Skin integrity. Uh, literally, the way this works is you put these little... Um, um, markers on your, on your leg over the muscle. This little machine here puts an electric pulse through this wire and into your muscle. And that can actually cause it to contract. And that's the way you do it internally, right? So our nerves in the spinal cord go to the muscle and cause you to contract. This little box here can do it from the outside. So it's going to contract that muscle. The benefits are that you're strengthening a specific muscle. So this person is going to strengthen their quadriceps muscle. That is really important because it increases the circulation to the area because you're stimulating, you're getting that muscle moving. And it's portable. That's a, a really nice thing. You can take that with you. You can take it with you on vacation. So there's really no reason to not exercise that muscle, even if you can't actively use it. This gives you an option for trying to get that muscle moving. Down here, I always put a question. The question I use, because I don't think there's anything that's black and white perfect, but if we're smart about how we use our rehab techniques, they can be very, very helpful. So I thought, can we use muscles strengthened by electrical stimulation as effectively as muscles strengthened by regular focused exercise? And in some people, yes, and in some people, no. So 
the way you exercise your muscle with this device is very much by turning on the electrical stimulation. That's very different than turning on your quadriceps when you're about to take a step, right? Because that's when you need it. So you can time this to go on at the right time when you walk, and that's what my next slide will show. The point I want you to take from this slide is that there is a way to stimulate a muscle that you might not actively be able to stimulate and get it to, get it to contract. Many of you may have seen this kind of ad. This is from BioNest. There's a walk aid. There's um, RT300 is another one. Essentially, it's a form of functional electrical stimulation. I have its limited but growing access. It's very, very accessible right now because the companies want to make money, right? But I'll tell you that I think it's a, real, it's a good device. It's very helpful for some people. The risks are that the initial cost is very high. So we're talking around $5,000 for one. Skin integrity is still an issue because literally you're driving electrical energy into the muscle. And so you don't want to have too much electrical energy, right? Because you'll burn yourself. Very time intensive in the sense of getting you set up for it. So it's time intensive to make sure the device is set up for you, is getting the right nerve stimulated, and is going to go off at the right time. Because you don't want the muscle that lifts your toes up to be on when I'm standing here, right? You don't, then I would fall over. So you really want it to go on when you're about to take a step or when you're bringing your foot forward. The benefits is that it does increase the strength of that muscle. So it improves the muscle bulk, which is good because when muscles get smaller, they get weaker. It, there's evidence that it improves bone density. As the muscles pull on the bones, they actually, um, that actually stimulates the bone and keeps the bone healthier. And improved circulation is another benefit. So the question I have is, will this be as applicable in MS as it's been for spinal cord injury? And I, I definitely think it's very effective. This is something definitely to keep your eye on. Right now, it's not covered by insurance for the most part. And if someone has a different example where it is, please let me know. But I think eventually it will. Taping. <clears throat> now, I warn you that this sounds a little hokey, but I've had very good results with this. So it's, it's increasingly used in neurologic, um, in people who have neurologic um, diagnoses, and most physical therapists will have heard of it. Some of them are trained in it, and some of them are not. The way it works, essentially, it, this is literally, it looks like um, tape that you would see um, a, uh, someone who has a knee injury have on them. But it's a little bit stretchy, and it's actually designed to be a specific amount stretchy so that you can use it on specific muscles. This is used on the back of the leg, so your hamstrings are sitting right here and right here. This tape is cut in the middle, and one piece goes down this side, and one piece goes down that side, and this actually can relax some muscles. So it can relax your hamstrings, which means you might be able to actually extend your leg all the way if you have a lot of spasticity in the back. So the risks are that there's tape allergies. If you have a tape allergy, that would be a limitation. Some skin irritation because it's, again, sticky on the skin. And you need a therapist to show you how to place it. And then they can actually train you to, to, to do it or have someone do it for you. The benefits are really great, though. There's results that can be visible within a week. So it's very non-invasive um, and cheap. Um, it can improve your posture because, again, if you can relax certain muscles, then you might be able to stand um, better and improve your posture. It, it, there's evidence that it facilitates activation. I've used it more for muscle relaxation. It's a very easy application because it's literally tape. So the question is, is it as effective on spastic muscles? And that's the question for you because I've seen it. I've definitely used it on some of my patients, but, um, and it's been effective on, um, on some of them, very effective, actually. Okay, partial body weight support. Uses, um, this is available in most outpatient clinics. It's this device here, kind of looks um, like a harness system. And essentially it allows people to walk without worrying about falling. And so then the therapist can actually work on other things um, while you're using it. So the risks are it's really bulky, it's a large piece of equipment, and you need a therapist, a skilled therapist, to know how to use it. The benefits is that the legs have to support less weight because this harness can actually hold you up a little bit. So it's a really nice way to try walking if you really um, have a hard time walking because you can't hold your weight. It's useful over ground or on a treadmill, um, meaning you can use this device while you're on a treadmill or walking. And it allows the therapist, as I said before, to focus on the other issues. 
The question is, does it carry over to walking on land? And by that, I mean, does it work if you don't use this? Right? That's the whole idea of therapy. You don't want to always need it. You want to try to work us out of a job. Right? And that's still, um, in some cases, it seems to be effective, but it's still unclear to me. Botox, or botulinum toxin, is another um, it's an injectable medication that blocks the neural passage that the muscle needs to contract. So essentially, it's going to relax the muscle that you inject it into. Um, the effects of the medication began after one to two weeks. The risks are that it's not really as effective when there's many, many muscles involved or when the muscles are really large, like your quadriceps. They're not the best one to use it on. But your tibialis anterior, the one that lifts your toes up, might be more effective. You need repeated injections because it's effective for several months, but then it goes away, which is not so bad if you want to try it, but it's bad if you need it for a continuous, continual basis. The benefits that it improves comfort, um, it really can improve spasticity symptoms. Um, it can it allow you to use the affected part of the body when you haven't been able to do that for, for some time. And it's effective, effective for um, a decent period of time, two to six months, depending on the person and the muscle. And the question I have is, is it most effectively used with stretching or splinting? So when you're using it, do you want to stretch the muscle, or is that going to make it too long and not useful, or do you want to splint it so you can shorten the muscle? OK, so those are some. There are, there are other neuro rehab options that you should ask about, talk to your physical therapist, your occupational therapist, your doctors. There are a couple of new ones. That, one that I really wanted to point out that's being done at Hopkins in, in my lab. And I'll... So this is the lab picture I showed you before, but now I'm showing you a, um, a treadmill here. And this treadmill is interesting. It's not your typical treadmill. It was designed specifically for us. There are two different belts here, one here, and there's a, there's a line in the middle there. And each belt is driven by a different motor. So you can actually have one going twice as fast, and you can have one going backwards if you want to. It sounds funny and not very useful. But when you think about it, when you're walking around a corner, one leg has to go faster than the other, right? So this actually can be a very useful tool in rehab. So when you walk, um, there are many things that your body has to be able to adapt to very flexibly and very quickly. So if you come across a rock, you have to be able to accommodate for that so you don't fall. Um, when you go from the grass to the cement, your body has to make some quick changes so that you don't fall over, right? But it also, there are also things that take a little bit longer to adapt to, like when you get a new pair of shoes. It kind of feels funny sometimes to walk in them, um, but over, over a few steps, you start to accommodate to that. And that, I'm going to use the word adaptation for that. So adaptation is the ability to learn a new way of walking, but it takes from minutes to hours to really get better at it. Now, I'm going to show you here. This is another animation that we do in our lab. This is actually a person. And they have a head this time, so that's good. <laughs> and I'm going to show you this person walking on the treadmill when the belts are tied. So that means both belts are going the same speed. So I want you to notice that there's no limping. It's a really smooth at the hips, the knees. Trunk isn't really moving much. It just looks like your average walking, right? Now we're going to split the belts. So we're going to make the right leg, which is this leg, the, the, far, the one further into the screen, go three times as fast as the left leg. So we're basically inducing a limp. That looks like a limp, right? So we, we're going to let that person walk on the treadmill for 10 minutes. And then we're going to, I'm going to show you a snapshot again of the same person. The treadmill is still going three times as fast on the right leg as opposed to the left leg. I want you to tell me what you see. They're not limping nearly as much, are they? It looks a lot better. So, so that's good. So we know that the body is making a change. But the most important thing is this next block here. What happens when we put the belts back together? Because really, you know, that's how we walk. We walk when the, the ground isn't really going two different speeds, right? So we should be able to just go right back, right? So I've actually induced a limp. Both belts are going the same speed. And that's important because that means that, that we've actually adapted a healthy person to walk in a different way. So 
that was the first study that really needed to be done because now we want to take people who really can't walk well and have an asymmetric walking pattern and see if we can make them walk better, right? So the first group we looked at was a group who had damage to their cerebellum. The cerebellum is a part of your brain in the, in the back that we know is really involved with coordination. So it really um, allows us to walk without thinking about it. Um, and once the cerebellum gets sick, walking gets really difficult. And people, have, people describe it as, I have to really think about each step. I have to think about how I'm moving my leg. And as long as I think about it, I can do it. But I can't do it automatically. And our question is, can the people who have damage to the cerebellum adapt to the treadmill? Can they actually learn a new walking pattern? So I'm going to show you first the, the cerebellar patient walking when the belts are tied. So it's a slower walk. It's a little bit more unsteady, because that's how people with cerebellar damage walk. <clears throat> now I'm going to split the belts now twice as fast on the right leg. So the same leg, the leg further into the screen, is going to be going twice as fast as the left leg. So they limp. It's a lot more of a limp, right? So we let them walk on the treadmill for 10 minutes. And I'm going to show you again over here what they look like. So remember with the healthy individual, once they'd been walking for 10 minutes, the limp mostly went away. That doesn't look any better to me. In fact, these two screens look very similar. I couldn't get them to play at the same time. I thought that would be the best way. but So you have to kind of believe me again. <laughs> now. Again, the most important test is once they've learned this adaptation, if we put the belts together again, did they really learn a new walking pattern, even when the belts are going the same speed? They don't really change anything. This is back to the way it was way over here on the first, the first slide. So it turns out that when you have damage to your cerebellum, that you really you can't adapt and you can't learn this new walking pattern. Now I'm going to tell you about a third group of people that we studied with this kind of paradigm of really trying to understand how can we change a walking pattern. There's a bunch of um, kids, probably, probably less than 1% of the population, but children who have um, long-term seizures. And the seizures are so bad that the way to fix it is essentially to take out one whole side of the cerebrum. So I'm showing you an MRI of a child who had the whole cerebrum taken out on the left side here. Cerebellum is still there. The right side of the brain is still there. So this is a pretty good indication of, do you really need this part of your brain to learn to, new, to do this new walking pattern? So I'm going to tell you the punchline first. So when you, when you take out part of the brain, it does not impair your ability to adapt. So you still can adapt. You can change your walking pattern. And I'm going to show you an example of a little girl on our treadmill. We're going to go through the same four slides. So in the beginning, the treadmill is uh, running with both belts tied. Just to give you a little insight, too, into, into these children. These kids are amazing. So they have half their brain taken out. You would think they couldn't move. But it turns out they can walk. They grow up. They use their arms. They, I, there's one um, girl that we test who's in college. So, so you can actually function quite well um, with this kind of a surgery. So the left, so the far leg is now is the one we're going to change eventually. But I want you to just watch that she doesn't step through with her left leg very well. It sort of stops right where the right leg is. And that's not the way we walk. We walk usually, we take a step and the other leg goes past the first leg, right? OK, now I'm going to show you the next one over here. I'm going to make the, the, this left leg, that far leg, go twice as fast as the first leg. So we're forcing her to actually spend more time on that right leg by making that left leg go faster. And that's her limping leg. So we're actually making her limp worse by doing this, right? OK, try to remember that image. Now, we're going to keep her walking on there for 10 minutes. And I'm going to show you what she looks like after 10 minutes. It's a lot better, isn't it? And it, it 
So now we're going to put the belts tied again. Let's put them back so they're going the same speed. And let's see if we've induced a limp again. And we do. So you really, this, this really is a good example of how you really can change a walking pattern just by exposure to how long the foot is actually on the ground. Because all this is really doing is forcing her to, to carry her weight on that right leg longer than the left leg. And this can be applied, we think, to other, um, other conditions as well. But it's definitely in its infancy. So we're at the point where we're just exploring how do we use this treadmill to really force people to learn to walk with a more symmetric pattern. And the only reason it needs to be more symmetric is because it's, it's less energy, uh, it's, it costs less energy-wise. <laughs> so it's more efficient for you, and you'll be able to go further and do more. I'm sorry, I thought I stopped it. There we go. So this is my last slide. And essentially, it's, I want to reinforce that we're testing new rehab approaches, approaches now. And there are places all over the country doing things like that. This is the treadmill, the split belt treadmill. There's only one other place in the US doing it. But there are other techniques that are being tested. So don't assume that if your physical or occupational therapist doesn't have anything new or talk about anything new, that nothing is going on. But do ask questions, because you want the best care that you can get. And the only way to get it is to really push yourself into that. So read the literature as much as you can, ask questions, and stay current with what's being tested. And consider being in studies, because that does give you the knowledge and the information ahead of time. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Any questions? Yes. That's right. Well, so the question is, if you don't have this kind of equipment, do you end up, do you have to walk in circles or do you, what, what can you do? There are actually circular treadmills that can do that. Um, my advice would be, if this equipment isn't going to be accessible anywhere, really, anywhere else in the country for, for therapy at this point. It's new, it, it's coming, it's up and coming. At this point, it's, it's definitely in more of the stages of understanding what we're doing. But the best thing you could do, I would say, is find a physical therapist, Make sure the physical therapist has time to address and evaluate you very specifically and to individualize your treatment. It shouldn't be something that you walk in the door and they put you on a bike for 10 minutes and say, I'll be back. They really need to put their hands on you and evaluate what they can. If they can't help you, they should, you should be able to talk to them just like you do your physician and say, this isn't working for me. I feel like I'm not getting any better. What do I do? And they should either be able to refer you to someone else or tell you what their limitation is. It should be a very much a communication, um, a good communication route to get the best out of rehab. Yeah. Um, I think Stanford is the one that has one, but it's not being used for rehab. It's being used for um, sports. Yes. Um, for something like uh, the NMES. Yeah. Okay. So as far as giving direction or just asking questions about the neuromuscular electrical stimulation, that's that device you just put on a muscle and can stimulate. If you go to, um, you need to be able to see a physical therapist to do it. So to do that, you need a physician's script to get to that. You need to talk to your PT, and, and the point of that device is to stimulate muscles that you can't, you can't contract on your own, or you can contract at a very small amount. And where should I be? <clears throat> Oh, they'll know about it. We're trained. This is a really common thing. The thing is, it's not always used for neuro. This is what I'm finding a lot. It's used for a knee injury. So if you have knee reconstructive surgery, you need to still um, work your quadriceps and hamstrings, so you use this. When in, in reality, especially with MS and TM, it's a central nervous system problem. So your peripheral nerves should be pretty healthy in general, and that means that this kind of device would work. It's just not thought of. And that's where you being really well informed can suggest it to your PT. There's nothing in the literature that would suggest not to use it unless there's something specific about your physiology, right? But so it shouldn't be a new thing. And I would worry if your PT has no idea what it is. <laughs> yes. 
Um, so is a good question. Is that a step up from a TENS unit, which is transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation? A TENS unit can often be used for pain, um, whereas um, NMES is really used to not for that kind of thing. So it has to do with the parameters that you use in, in the box. So it is a different device. So the question is, um, you lost function in your left upper, your left shoulder, your deltoid muscle, and you're wondering if this kind of electrical stimulation would be helpful. So not knowing you and not having evaluated you, it's hard for me to say. Overall, yes, if, if your deltoid is really specifically involved and other muscles around are still doing some work, then this could be very helpful to you. It depends on why you lost function of your deltoid. If it's because of a central nervous system issue, then this should be helpful. If it's because you have a pinched nerve um, in the periphery, then that won't be as helpful. So I would, I would definitely go back to your physician and say, you know, maybe I should try physical therapy and see if I can use this electrical stimulation. Is there any benefit to having your own treadmill at home? So the, the best benefit is that it's at home and you can do it in the rain or the shine, shine. You can walk. You want to try to raise your heart rate. The downside to using a treadmill when you have trouble walking is that you might be causing more problems. So I would recommend if you're having trouble walking and you want to use your treadmill, start out by going to a physical therapist. Have them look at you specifically and say, you know, I, I'd like to use my treadmill at home. How would you recommend I do it? Because walking, again, is very complicated in the sense that you can, if you're walking and you're walking in a, um, and you're, you're tripping or you're walking in a way that's very energy costly. I oh, okay. You get. So that's a good, okay, so the point is she was saying it's not that her walking is bad to begin with, it's after she exercises, and that's a really common problem, right? So the way to, to, to gauge that is to listen to your body. So clearly you're, you're doing too much. So I would go by minutes. I would start out, get on your treadmill for two minutes and see what you feel like the next hour. You don't want to be so debilitated or so exhausted for the rest of the day that you can't do anything but recognize that your physiology can catch up. So you need to improve your cardiovascular function so that you can, you can put out the energy you need to walk and still be able to do something later that day. But it's a slow process. So you fall a lot and, and because you have so much lower body weight. So this is also a good indicator. Just saying that to me makes me think you should definitely see a physical therapist because if nothing else, you can stand up from, everyone should be able to get up from the ground because if you fall, you want to know at least how to have someone help you get up. <laughs> and you want to know which muscles are weakest so you can strengthen them so that you can get yourself off the ground. But, it, but don't underestimate. So go to your PT and be really talkative. I know I have this trouble. What do I do? Be really proactive. Don't, and if you feel like they're not listening, go to someone else, just like you would do for your neurologist. You wouldn't go to just anyone. You go to a neurologist that knows about your condition, right? And if you don't like them, you go to someone else. Yeah, she's been waiting a long time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. 
So if I paraphrase, just so everyone gets the idea, you can correct me if I'm wrong. So she uses a walk aid, which is a version of that, um, of the Bioness, essentially to lift your toes when you take a step. And, and essentially, it's about $4,700 each. Her insurance doesn't cover it, so it's out of pocket, but it's very effective. And I've seen that with several people in our clinic, that it really can help because not being able to lift your toe to take each step means that you're changing how you're, how you're moving at your knee and your hip and your trunk. So if you can fix that, at least partially by using a device like that, that can prevent back problems in the future and hip problems, that kind of thing. Right. So they ended up not getting it because of the cost, which is exactly the case. Who has $5,000 to spare all the time? <laughs> so I think in the future it will be. I do think they need more studies before um, insurance will recognize it, but it's coming. So I would just keep up with the literature until it, it happens. Pardon? Oh, yeah. You, the insurance company will, I mean, the, um, the companies will have no problem express, telling everyone when insurance covers it. <laughs> because they're going to want you to buy it. So I, I, should let, I should go. If anyone has questions, I'm here the rest of the day, too.